Well, good morning and welcome, Trinity Church. Would you guys join me, us, in standing and worshiping our King this morning?
Amen. Well, good morning, Trinity Church. Why don't you turn around and say good morning to someone, but please stay standing. go into another song right now. We're just going to sing a song that declares God is our light, our guiding light, um, light unto our path. So whether we're going through hard times or going through easy times, let's, uh, let's look to the Lord to guide us. Here we go. In my wrestling, in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa. You are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my trouble sea. Whoa. You are the peace in my trouble sea. Hey, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you. Well, guys, why don't you take a seat? Hi, good morning to you. How are you doing today? 
Good. Well, I have a treat for you today. You're going to get to meet the Nyenheis family, especially our friend Levi today. So we're doing a child dedication, and uh, let me introduce these guys to you. This is David and Brianna and their son, Levi Davidson Nyenheis, who turned two yesterday. Pretty cool. So it's a great thing. You guys have, I'll just mention real quick, you guys have a great group of family and friends over here. Um, we're just going to have you guys, why don't you wave to them so they can all see that you're still here and that you're excited for them. Okay. And a lot of cousins too. I see them in there as well. Well, what we do when we think about parent-child dedication, we got to meet this last week with um, all three of these guys. And as we talked to them, we said, you know, what they want to do just so you can get a frame of reference, they're actually, David and Brianna are coming and saying today, we want to be parents who raise Levi in a manner pleasing to God. So in some ways, a child dedication is much less about Levi and much more about them. And what we do today is we're asking them to make some commitments as the way that they would want to raise him, and we're going to get a chance to pray over Levi as well. Well, the Bible tells us that in order to be parents who do this, who raise our kids in a God-honoring way, that we need to saturate our homes with his love and with his truth. And so one of the passages that we talked about is this great passage from Deuteronomy 6. Let me read it to you. It says, first to you guys, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be upon your hearts. And so Moses talking to a new generation who were going to go in and receive all the promises that God had in the promised land. He's telling them as parents, love God wholeheartedly, and these are the things that you're to walk in. But then he says this, impress them on your children. This great little guy right here today. And talk about them when you, and so it's answering the question, how do you do that? Well, talk about these when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And so the idea of this saturating your home with this great truth of who God is and the everyday rhythms of how Levi is being raised, that's this great opportunity and great responsibility for you. And we want to be a people, and we were talking about this the other day, this group of people as you look out today, many of them are going to have the unique opportunities to be involved in your lives and in your sons. Already you guys are a part of a great small group, and you guys are doing life together with other young parents and other children who are involved in Levi's life as well. But there are people out here today who are going to be working in our children's programs that Levi's a part of. There are people who are gonna ultimately be middle school and, and high school small group leaders for him, which I know seems like billions of miles away. He's two. But these are people who are gonna help you in that process and wanna be great um, allies to you. So today I want to ask you, would you commit yourself to these things? Do you commit yourselves to be mindful that Levi is a gift from God, a God who loves him even more than you do? Do you commit to saturate your home with God's instruction? Do you commit to prepare Levi to live a rooted and reaching life that will be anchored in Jesus and engaging his relational world? Do you commit to provide Levi with correction and discipline? And do you commit to encourage Levi in his growth and maturity? It's obvious that you guys want to uh, raise Levi in a manner pleasing to God. And you agree with these great words that Joshua said, one of the men from that generation that Moses was talking to he claimed this, that as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So let me take a minute today. We're going to pray for Levi. Levi, I know. I'm super excited too. I'm going to have, I'm going to have you stay with dad, but I'm going to put a hand on you and we'll pray for you today, okay? <laughs> Father God, we want to thank you so much for the Nyenheis family. We want to thank you for David and Brianna and how you even led them here to Trinity a couple years ago, right about the time when Levi was being born. And we're grateful for his life. God, this two-year-old who just has so much uh, potential, so much joy that he already brings to them and to the people he comes in contact with, we pray that you would continue to walk with him, continue to be so present with him, continue to help him understand who you are, his, your incredible love for him, and would he understand your purpose for his life, God. Thank you for David and Brianna. Thank you for their love for you, their desire to raise Levi in a manner that he would know you, he would love you, he would understand how truly great you are. And we pray today that we as a church would come alongside them and be great allies in the process. 
Thank you so much. We pray blessing on this family. Thank you for all of their family and friends who are here supporting them today and are excited to see what lies before this young life. We love you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you give these guys a hand today? Good job, you guys. Well, we have a lot in store today, and uh, it's already starting off in such a great way. I wanted to remind you of the song we sang just a minute ago. The worship team did such a great job. I was here in the first service, and I was clapping the whole time. I can't help it. When Rin Collective comes on, my hands just automatically know what to do. But just a great song of joy and a great song of promise. The idea of considering God as our lighthouse. And when you think about that, when is a lighthouse necessary? Not when the sun is shining and you're out on open seas and everything's going great, great wind getting you where you need to go. A lighthouse is needed when it's dark. A lighthouse is needed when you are drifting near the shoreline that's full of rocks, full of danger. And the great news about this song is it says that, God, you are like a lighthouse. You provide not only direction, not only light to light my way, but ultimately you will lead me safely to shore. You see, today at communion, we celebrate this idea of what God has done for us and the the idea of sending his one and only spotless lamb into our world to die on our behalf. We celebrate a death. It's a wild thought. There's no other time and place where you do that. But we do that on communion Sundays because we recognize God, apart from what Jesus did on our behalf, we would be forever lost. There's no degree of religion that would ever light the way. There's no degree of morality that would ever be enough to get us safely to shore. So we say, Jesus, thank you. You are truly the way, the truth, the life. And the life that you offered on a cross, you did so for us, so that we could arrive safely to shore. And we talk about that, just so you're clear today, not just in this life, getting us through the challenges we face, but ultimately into life eternal. You have to keep in mind the hope of heaven if you're gonna make it through today. So I wanna encourage you, I have no idea the things you're going through today. I have no idea if you're near a rocky coastline or if you're out sailing in the beautiful open seas. But the reality is to all of us, Jesus today offers himself to be our lighthouse because of what he's done in our place. Today as these elements pass around, if you are a follower of Jesus, you are so welcome to receive them and to engage with us today, whether Trinity is your home church or not. If you're here today and you have never put your faith in Jesus, I just wanna say, what is keeping you from that? What is the barrier, the obstacle that is keeping you from saying, I do, I need to admit that I need a savior. My way has not worked. I need to believe that Jesus is the only savior available. And God, I wanna choose to live my life following Jesus' example. That is a response to Jesus' offer of salvation. I wanna encourage you today, even as the elements are being passed around, if you've never made that decision, do it today. And receive these elements as they were always intended to be received, as that of gratitude and celebration for what God has done for you. As the elements come around today, there's a a cracker, there's a cup, take one of each, hold them, until we're all uh, being served and then we'll receive them together. If you have a gluten-free need today, there's crackers in the back. We wouldn't want you to miss out on receiving communion with us. Let me pray. Father God, we come before you today a people of gratitude. We have no hope, no standing aside from what Jesus did on our behalf. So it's out of that gratitude, but also humility. There's not one of us who can stand before you out of our own merit. And for that, we're grateful. We're grateful that Jesus became this sacrifice, that he bore our sin and in exchange gave us the ability to stand rightly before you. For that, we celebrate and we're thankful today. We love you and we pray in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Before the throne 
just love that song so much in the second verse especially God the just 
is justified to look on him, to look on Jesus who bore all the sin of the world. But let's, let's not make that so, let's just talk about you. He bore all of your sin. All that in the past, all that today, all that tomorrow. Who bore my sin and yet pardons me. And that's the incredible power of the cross, that God still dealt with sin, but dealt with it with someone else, someone in your place, the spotless lamb of God. So as we take this bread, it represents his body broken for us. He told his people, his disciples, when you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. Let's engage today. We know that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So after dinner that night, he took the cup and he passed it. And he said, this represents the blood of the new covenant, the blood that will be shed for the sins of the world. So as we take today, let us remember that it is because of the blood of Jesus Christ that we find pardon. Shall we take And now, Father, we just thank you for this opportunity of being able to share in the elements, of being able to once again be reminded of who you are and what it cost us to be people who can be followers of Jesus Christ. So today, Lord, we commit our time to you now in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, if you're wondering what to do with your cup, we have some bowls that are going to be going around. Let's continue to worship the Lord this morning.
pray together. Oh, Father, we confess, we proclaim that you are high above it all. Lord, these truths that we sing in this place, our soul needs to know and remember and proclaim and find strength and hope in you. And we thank you, God, that we have these songs to proclaim these truths with and these people who are singing them all around us. Father, just listening to first service, I was singing the line, when I'm weary and I'm weak, you are all the strength I need. That was my day yesterday. And I know I'm not alone. There are others maybe had a day like that or a week like that or already right now. It's where they're at. Thank you that you are high above it all. You are almighty God. And Father, we want to pray for those who are really suffering today. We were so grateful for the rain. We needed it. You poured it out on our land. And yet, not very many miles away, people lost their homes. In the floods, they lost their loved ones. And Father, we pray that you would comfort those people. You are near to the brokenhearted, to all who call on you in truth. I pray that they would call on you and they would find you right there, carrying them through. Father, I 
pray for the community of believers in Montecito area, that they would reach out with your compassion and love and hope. And God, that you would shine as a light, a lighthouse in the darkness. You would carry them through the storm. Thank you that that's who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Well, it's a real privilege to be with you today. What a, I always, I look forward to these moments that we get to be together. There's such strength in coming to the Lord and putting our focus on him and singing these praise songs together and hearing from his word, which we'll do in a minute. We're going to do things a little differently than usual. We're going to actually have the ushers come forward now. And we're going to receive the offering. And uh, if you're a guest with us, please be our guest. Don't feel obligated to give. And I'm just going to share a couple announcements as they do that. Um, but we worship the Lord by giving back to him, by giving thanks, by trusting him and entrusting to him what he's given us. So that's part of what's happening so uh, if you're a guest with us, we are delighted that you're here. We'd love to get to know you. We'd love to get, help you get connected. There's a welcome card. It's in the seat back in front of you. I'm, I'm going to guess you, if you didn't know that, you probably won't get it in the offering bag right away, but that's okay. There's a welcome center right out the back doors, and there are people who'd love to talk with you. So please just take that card out the back doors to the welcome center and um, connect, connect with people who are here for you. Um, I want to share a couple things that are going on. Trinity this week is a brochure that was given to you. There's a lot happening at Trinity. I'm going to point out four things real quickly. First, there's a men's breakfast. It's happening on Saturday. You've heard about it, hopefully. Um, the men have a fun time. We will laugh together. It's a meaningful time. It's a great time to be with other guys. I encourage you to come out for this. Tickets are still available outside or online. And they will be this week. So um, please uh, bring, bring people with you. Bring other guys. Second is there's a Mexico trip. It's coming up in March. But here's the thing about it. If you want to go on that, you have to have a passport and pass cards. So we're telling you early so you can be praying about it, finding out about it. There's an information meeting in a few Sundays on the 28th. But I went on this trip last year with my family. And I want to tell you, I was kind of holding off, thinking, ah, oh, are my kids old enough yet? Um, I have kids six. I had kids last year, six through 14. They were, and we had a fantastic time as a family. Um, the trip, the whole trip with Trinity people, over 100 people usually, is a wonderful experience. I want to encourage you to go. Talk to me if you want to know a little bit more about that um, or go to that information meeting. We like to talk about next steps at Trinity. If in these two that I'm gonna share with you are especially good for people who are newer to Trinity or you're just kind of plugging back in in this new year, there's a class called Discovering God's Design. And the scriptures say that every believer, every person, every follower of Jesus is needed and necessary for the body of Christ to function properly. So God has given you gifts and you get to use those gifts to make Trinity Church function properly. And that's what this class is about, discovering what is the passion that God's put in your heart, how has he gifted you, and where are there needs at Trinity where you can plug in. And the last thing is baptism class. We have baptisms about four times a year. Um, they are going to happen on the 28th right behind me. We'll take this banner down, and uh, we, we have a baptismal right there. It is a fantastic thing. But we want you to know what baptism is. So there's a class next Sunday. I believe it starts third hour. The information's in your Trinity this week. But it's just find out what baptism is. You get to um, talk with some folks about that. And I encourage you, if God's putting that on your heart, obey him, follow him in this. It's a blessing to you and to those who get to witness on the 28th. So God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Please uh, give your attention to the... I'm part of the fellowship. The fellowship. The fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. 
The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his. I won't look back, let up. Back away or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking. Smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, or popularity. I don't have to be right. Recognized, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith. Lean on his presence. Walk by patience. I'm uplifted by prayer and labor with power. My face is set. My gait is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions are few, but my guide is reliable. My mission is clear. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice. Hesitate in the presence of the enemy. Pander at the pool of popularity. Or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must keep going until he comes. Give until I drop. Preach until all know. And work until he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My banner will be clear. All right. <clears throat> I uh, love it. I love that uh, video for so many reasons. One, I just love seeing Trinity faces uh, on our screen, but I love the content of it. And as you're here with us today, we're in week two of a brand new series called Inverted, living right side up in an upside down world. And that's what's so great about the content of those words that are being shared by folks that are a part of this fellowship is that, God, I want to walk your way, even if the crowds are walking in the opposite direction. I want to walk and do that in your strength, and we're going to talk about that today, not because we keep trying harder, but because we surrender the ability to say, God, I can't do this. I need your power and strength to do it, and that's what we're excited to look at today. We're in a series in the book of Daniel. If you want to find your way there in your Bible, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel's one of the writing prophets uh, in the former covenant, the Old Testament. If you find your way there, you'll be set. Otherwise, also, there are a set of notes that are in your Trinity this week that you received on the way in today that'll help you track with us in the service today. But also, if you're in a home group, there are your, your notes for your discussion this week. And I hope that that's a, a good time as well. Um, I'm excited to uh, dive in another step as we look at this narrative today. I love preaching the narratives of scripture. And I want to say in the beginning, let's, let's work hard today to get into the sandals of Daniel and his friends, because it's going to be a narrative that is so hard to connect to, so hard to relate to. But I think if we stop and process, we'll see there are places of connection in our life. One of the things that's so powerful in the book of Daniel are all of the focused, um, intentional prayers. And today is going to be the first time that we get to see that with great clarity. One of the things I appreciate this, our prayer team and our prayer core here at Trinity has really led us well in this series is to engage in some very focused prayer. How many of you got the prayer prompts on your phone this week? Okay, excellent. Well, if you didn't get a chance to do that, I want to give you another shot today. And the way is this, all you need to do, uh, if you have your phone, you can literally get it out now. No one will think it's weird that you're doing it because I'm telling you to. Um, if you dial on your texting 81010, that's 81010, and, and to that number, text at... TC for Trinity Church at TC Prayer. Then throughout this week, you're going to get some prayer prompts. I got those as well this week. And just a great way to stop and consider, God, these are the kinds of things that I want to continue, that I need to continue to be praying for in my own life and in the lives of others around me in my relational world. So through this prayer initiative, that is one aspect, or just throughout the week, getting some of these prayer prompts, following the example of Daniel and these friends of saying, God, we're so dependent upon you for your strength, your power, your wisdom. The other thing is, is that there's a couple different focused worship and prayer nights. One of them is tonight. 
Tonight at 7 o'clock, we're going to be here in the worship center. And if you've never been to an event like this that had a real focus on prayer, it could be intimidating. Some of us just kind of freeze up whenever we even think about the potential of praying in a group. And let me just give you a couple words of, of comfort, I guess you'd say, in this. I really want to encourage you to come tonight because in it, there won't be the pressure that you ever have to pray out loud or pray in some sort of way that you think everyone's looking at you. It's a great community opportunity to come before the Lord and say, God, we live among a people who, generally speaking, are not walking your way. Not only do we want to walk your way, we want to be a people of influence in others' lives. And that's going to be the focus of this time tonight, a connection to God and the ability to be influential with others. So come tonight, experience it. Even for the first time, there'll be prayer stations where you kind of move from one kind of focused thought and prayer time to another. And I think you're going to dig it, especially if it's something you've never tried before, but are maybe uh, maybe I'll, I'll see what that's about. Seven o'clock right here. And a third kind of piece to this prayer initiative is also the idea of some focused prayers in our services, of which today we'll, we'll participate in. So you'll see about that in just a few minutes. Well, in our series, is sometimes it's very easy to become discouraged when it looks like the culture is, we said earlier, walking in the opposite direction. And God, how do I keep going? How do I press forward? And how do I do it in a way that is, again, not just holding ground, but in a way that's actually influential in other people's lives? And that's what this series is about because we see that in the lives of Daniel and Hananiah and Azariah and Mishael. And as we look at this topic today, as we look at this whole series, the reality is it should not surprise us. Sometimes that's helpful just to kind of take the air out of the issue sometimes. It should not surprise us that our culture is where it's at. Paul, writing to the church at Rome, he lays out an idea and he basically says this, if we as a people will set aside God's design and insert instead something else of our own, it's always going to lead to the same direction. And culture over culture, people over people, it always ends up the same. This is what he wrote to the Romans in chapter one. You can see it on the screen. For although they knew God, <clears throat> they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their, fut and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so, they might, so that they might do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. I read Romans 1 and I read about a post-Christian America. We defined that term last week. We, didn't, we said it, it doesn't mean that there are no Jesus followers in this country. It's just that by and large, as a people, we're walking a path different from a Judeo-Christian approach that we had maybe done in, in decades and generations previously. And this is where we find ourselves today. One of the things that we said we wanted to do throughout this series was start every week by having these four ideas, these four axioms that will help us hopefully stay in tension. You see, our goal during this series is on the one hand to keep from just simply blending into the culture, just being absorbed into a world that is truly walking away from God. But on the other hand, we don't want to come here every Sunday and just culture bash. There's no value in that. So instead, trying to find God, where's the tension, where's the balance you want us to walk in? And these four axioms we're gonna talk about on a weekly basis to be able to keep our attention really where it needs to be and try to walk this line, this tightrope throughout our culture. One of the things I wanna do today is that today, if you didn't know this already, is what churches all around the world are celebrating as Sanctity of Life Sunday. This weekend, every year for the last few years, there has been a focal point of saying God values life so very, very much. And in a culture, in a world that is not, we want to be people who speak the truth in love. And so today what I want to do is I want to talk to this idea of the sanctity of life through the lens of these axioms that we looked at last week. Let me apply them to the issue of abortion. First off, number one, Christians have always lived in oppositional cultures. 
Here's what we know. We know without, again, any astuteness or any taking time to even think about it. Back in the 1960s, America chose to say that if a woman does not want to go through the pregnancy, she is legally allowed to terminate the pregnancy, to kill the child. That is a known thing. Poll after poll has shown that most Americans believe this is appropriate and acceptable. So our culture is walking one direction. We believe the Bible teaches something very different. So we, we know in which we live. Number two, our enemy is Satan, not people. I want you to hear this very clearly today because there are people who miss this within our evangelical community all the time. People even acting in ways that are so egregious and so opposite of God's direction are always pawns in the hand of someone else. The Bible talks about the idea that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Satan is always the one behind acts of treachery, acts that are against the design of God. So no matter if they are medical staff, no matter if they are counselors encouraging people to have abortions, whether they are even women who have had them, they are not the enemy. It is always Satan's work behind the scenes that is actually the one that we need to look to and the one we need to identify. Number three, I love this. God calls us to rescue people, not the culture. This was the axiom we shared last week. God calls us to rescue people, not the culture. So this, while there are Christians, and I believe there might be a place to, as Christians talk about public policy, we, we don't want to put all of our energies and efforts up here at changing a culture when we forget the people in the middle who form those ideas and talk about them along the way. That is the area of influence that God would have us to go through relational um, opportunities that we have with people. So here's what we do, and I love this. Last year, we put together something like this about how we wanna be a people who don't curse the darkness, but instead light candles. And that's one way we can do this. One way that we can be a people who are rescuing people rather than the culture are ways that we can support the San Bernardino Pregnancy and Family Resource Center. We partnered with them in multiple ways, even recently in our Advent Conspiracy, but even now in, in this opportunity throughout the rest of this month. On the back, you'll notice there, there are items. These have been specified by the Pregnancy and Family Center of things that are of need. And so as you bring these over the next two Sundays, there'll be a place very obvious out on the plaza where they can be received. I want to encourage you, give generously. And by the way, give according to this. If you have things that really don't fit this, can I tell you, this is a pretty exhaustive list. It means they probably don't need them. So look at this. Go shopping with this in mind. Last year, I took this with me when I went to Costco, and it was really easy to know what size of diapers to buy. Okay, so bring, use this, bring resources that are very tangible and bring them out to the plaza the next two Sundays, the 21st and 28th, and then we'll make sure that they get to them um, this month when we're done collecting. One of the things that I think is powerful, by the way, too, about the idea of rescuing people, I think of parents who choose to adopt, and especially when there is the potential of a life being lost, they stepped in and said, we will gladly embrace and bring this young person into our home and raise them in a way that would be pleasing to God. I thought it was especially beautiful today that we did a child dedication on Sanctity of Life weekend. It was just a really cool way to get to celebrate that. We wanna be a redemptive people who keep pointing people no matter where they're at in the continuum, that God is always a God who rescues. God is always a God willing and able to forgive. Number four, disagree with opinions, not people. Disopin di uh, disagree with op opinions, not people. And the reason we're saying that is this, so often there are people in your life right now who have a, a differing view, a, a view related to abortion that is against the grain of what the Bible teaches. And if you do this, it's, it's very appropriate and right to speak the truth in love and to be sh able to share the truth of God's word related to the value of life. But to take their opinion and basically summarize that whole person by their opinion is to write them off and probably not give you an opportunity to be a person of influence in days to come if they end up changing their mind if they end up through a sequence of circumstances coming to a different conclusion, you now have an opportunity, even though you've disagreed with the idea, you haven't disagreed with them. 
These are four axioms that, according to this issue of sanctity of life, we get to focus on today and get our brains and our lives thinking on the right tracks. God, we want to honor you in a culture that is choosing not to. So today, back to our text. Here's our now what idea. Be reliant on God to provide exactly what you need and watch him do what only he can do. Be reliant on God to provide exactly what you need and watch him do what only he can do. In our notes, number one, upside down people can demand the impossible and penalize unjustly. We live in an upside down culture. People sometimes from that culture can demand the impossible and penalize unjustly. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced a Monday like this before, but this is how it went with Daniel and his friends. Daniel chapter two, verse one. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell them what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, may the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what the dream was, and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your house is turned into piles of rubble. I don't know if that happened to you recently on the job, but that's what happened to these guys. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, uh, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more, they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. Same thing he said a minute ago. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there's only one penalty for you. You You've conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers answered the king, there is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and the men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Boom, okay, right out of the gates. This is a tough passage, this is a tough reality. And like we said, we wanna get into the story and not read it as some great flannel graph from third grade. This is a today, this is for you, this is some of the things you're working through. A, A little bit different change of course, but when you think about the fact that you could die quickly. I don't know if you saw the news, but the people of Hawaii thought that was happening yesterday. Right, Massive texts all over the island of Oahu that an imminent missile strike was coming and it wasn't a drill. It's fascinating, I read a few accounts of how people responded because there was no idea that this was just something that was an errant text. By the way, talk about an error, right? I just made thousands of people think they're about to die. But those people were going through that thought, emotional, reality process of going, I could die in seconds. Daniel and his friends, the very last words we read, they're rounding up the other wise men of the kingdom to have them all executed. That's what's on the line. You and I haven't faced death like that very often, if at all, but we have faced some challenges that looked as though our, as though our whole life, our whole career, our whole series of relationships were on the line. So let's get into the narrative today and find ourselves somewhere in the story. This is how it begins. We see that the king is troubled by this dream and basically at the end of the day, he's just tired of it. He's he's wised up to a couple things. He employs a, a great amount of people. All of these, by the way, are trained in the ways of witchcraft and the occult. You have to see it for what it is. As we are reading, you're kind of wondering, is this Harry Potter? Like, what's going on? All the wizards and enchanters, what's going on? This is who this group of people were. And so what Nebuchadnezzar used them for was to say, I want you to tell me what's going to happen. That's what they were employed to do. Speak about the future. Interpret dreams. Give me understandings and visions so I can know what to do. That was their sole purpose. Well, Nebuchadnezzar had had it. 
He realized that he was being manipulated, so he says, I don't really think you have any real power. Let's put it to the test. Don't just interpret the dream. Tell me the dream. Tell me what I dreamed, and then tell me what it means. And as they go through this whole process, you catch the incredible absurdity Right, you get it, like no one is able to do this. And interestingly enough, the wise men, after a few conversations, say exactly these words. They speak very truthful words. No one can do what the king is asking. And we realize the tyrannical heart of Nebuchadnezzar because he doesn't just want to expose them. He doesn't want to just say, you're truly not able to do what, you th- what I thought you were able to do or what you're here for. I'm going to kill you if it doesn't work out, if you prove to be the phonies that you are. So the guy, rightfully so, is a madman. Now, when you think about some of this reality, one of the things I think that's a very fair question that raises, it raised in my head. Last week, if you were here, you remembered that Daniel and his friends, they were resolved not to defile themselves by eating the king's food, okay? And and we talked about that that wasn't just a smallish thing. In the, in the Jewish understanding, God had given very clear black and white realities of what they could eat and what they could not. So it wasn't a gray area. But some of you are doing the math and you're going, okay, wait a second. They took a hard stance on not eating bacon, but yet now they're being schooled in the ways of witchcraft and they don't seem to be protesting. One looks a little bit more important than the other. If you're going to make that kind of strong stand about eating pork, why wouldn't you make the same stand about engaging in uh, an education in astrology? It's a fair question. And as I was processing it and as I was reading and getting different ideas, basically commentators come to the same conclusion. Daniel and his friends potentially had the ability to influence the situation with their diet, and they gave, like we said last week, a great um, idea of what to do instead, a great alternative This time, though, when you think of their academic studies, this idea of understanding the ways of witchcraft, that's what they were there for. Nebuchadnezzar exiled them, stole them from their homes and their families and their cities, and brought them here primarily for this purpose, to be trained to tell him what the future was. There was really no avoiding it. So this is what we find that I think is a really powerful truth. In the midst of an educational system that was so against what God had designed, they were able to stay focused on Yahweh both in the classroom and out of class. And as we see in the narratives, they kept their hearts toward him no matter what they were being trained or taught. And that's a powerful reality for us to consider no matter what degree of education that we receive in our lives, whether in a classroom or in the media or any other place, God, we have the ability to not necessarily go with a flow, but instead to keep our minds set on you and to walk your way. So in this contrast, they have this conversation and the, these, um, quote, wise men rightly understand the issue. King, there is no one on the planet who can do what you're asking. This is an absolutely absurd idea. Only, quote, the gods know these things. And the interesting thing is they were completely correct in everything they said. No matter, Nebuchadnezzar sends out the death warrant. Everyone's going to be herded in, and they're going to be executed. These are very, very challenging, frightful days. It leads us to number two. Right-side-up people respond with perception, partnership, and prayer. Right-side-up people, they respond with perception, partnership, and prayer. Continuing on in chapter 2, verse 14. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out and put to death, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. And I love those words. He said to the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king, and he asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven, and this is what he said. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. 
He reveals deep and hidden things, and he knows what lies in darkness, and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you, and you have made known to us the dream of the king. God shows up in a miraculous way. And here's what it lay, how it lays out. Daniel, and this is what I want you to catch, Daniel in the midst, he and his friends are most likely not even through this training yet, but somewhere in the middle of it. But they're a part of the wise men because they're being trained to be such. This commander of the army comes and herds him up, grabs him and his friends, he's gonna take him to death. But here's the wild thing. In the midst of that kind of chaos, Daniel has the wisdom intact to say, can you help me understand why the king is being so harsh? He just asks a question. I've been very fortunate in my life to spend time with people who are truly biblically wise. And one of the characteristics I've noticed of them is that they're really great at asking questions. You see, it would have been my knee-jerk reaction, probably yours, that in the face of opposition, I'm gonna get defensive I'm gonna start talking about my rights and how you can do. Daniel, first thing he does, this is very extreme. Can you help me understand why the king would be so harsh? He just asks a good question, and as a result, he's able to have entrance to the king, able to plead for more time so that they can get what he's asking for and to go back to his God, the God of Israel, to find this need. The king grants it. Here's what I want you to see. It not only was that sense of, of perception of being wise in the middle of it, but it was also a sense of partnership because remember what he did. As soon as he came back, they all probably had the same kind of quarters. He came back to his other friends. He quickly enlisted them. You've got to help me. Let's pray that God would show us what we need to know. That is a powerful reality out of this passage. Daniel didn't bear the burden alone of the needs that were before him. He encouraged, he engaged other people in his relational world who loved God like he did. Would you pray along with me for this need? That is a powerful reality, a principle for us to stop and consider that this is something that they did, that they engaged this together. And what did they engage? They engaged prayer. They went right to the source. They knew, God, you are, the wise men that already talked to the king were absolutely right. You are the only one who can interpret, who can give us this dream so we can tell the king we're lost apart from you. And what I love so much about this ability of going to others and, and seeking them to pray along with us, this is something so tangible and real that we can also engage something we should engage. I have it in your notes. A big idea here is that we ought to ask other Jesus followers around you to pray when you face challenging circumstances in an upside down world. Gather a group of other people who love Jesus and, and ask them to pray alongside of you. And here's the thing, for some of us we'd say, Todd, I don't even know where to start. I don't know where to find that group. And for others of us, the minute I say that, you know exactly what to do. They're called your small group. Whether you meet in a men's group or a women's group or a family home group or whatever it is, you have a group of people that when you are facing insurmountable realities, you know exactly who to talk to. You know exactly who to entreat. Would you please join me in praying for this need? And I want to encourage you, if you're on the fence about why would I join a small group of some sort, if only for this reason to have a group of people that you're gonna walk through life with and you for them and them for you get to be a group of people that pray for one another and walk with each other through challenging circumstances. This was Daniel's small group. And as soon as he recognized this need, he ran right to them. The cool thing is in this sequence, God gives Daniel what he asked for. He gives him the dream and the interpretation. And I love that Daniel's um, prayer of praise is recorded. That prayer that we read is so rich. Great things that Daniel rightly ascribes to Yahweh. His power, his wisdom, his sovereign control over who's in control. Remember we said that last week. Daniel and his friends were convinced that God is in control of who's in control. That's a great hypothesis and theorem, but when you are under the leadership, under the authority of someone that you just even question their sanity, this is a thing to remember 
And by the way, most likely the authority figure you're under has not recently had some sort of reason to even put you to death. That was the kind of leadership that Daniel was under, but Daniel was convinced God is in control of who's in control. As he ascribes these things to God, he gives sweet words of praise and adoration, thanking God for who he is and how he works on their behalf, even when they live in an upside down world. Finally today, number three, when God provides what you need, give him the credit. When God provides what you need, give him the credit. We're gonna read a portion, not the rest of the passage, but a portion starting in verse 24. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and he said to him, don't do it. Don't execute the wise men. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles of Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? And I love this response. Daniel replied, no wise man, no enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he is asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries, I love that title, showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your, and watch this is a purpose statement, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. He says in verse 31, your majesty looked and there before you stood a large statue an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, and its legs of iron, its feet partially of iron and partially of baked clay. When you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on the threshing floor of the, in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. Watch this. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. We don't have time today to look at all of the rest of this chapter, but let me give you the the basic idea of it. Daniel rightly affirms everything people have told you is true. No person can give you the dream and the interpretation, but there is a God in heaven, a revealer of mysteries who can. And he begins to tell Nebuchadnezzar about a dream that he saw. He saw a statue, and it had basically four types of materials in which it, with which it was built. Gold at the head, who Daniel is then going to interpret and say, that represents you, Nebuchadnezzar. And then silver, and then bronze, and then iron and clay. And as he walks through those, he basically says that this statue was there, and then there's this rock, there's this something else, not made of human hands, and this rock comes and it hits the statue and the whole thing is destroyed. It blows away in the wind. Now, these words, we believe Daniel penned about 600 BC in the middle of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. He ascribes Nebuchadnezzar as the head, but doesn't say who these other nations are. We don't have time to get into this amazing historical prophecy of three more mega kingdoms, like worldwide leading kingdoms that would arise. But rightly so, I think commentators speak of Medo-Persia, the next world power to be that of silver, Greece, bronze, Rome, that of iron and clay. But the point is this, I want you to see Jesus in this passage. I want you to see God establishing a kingdom unlike any of the others, not made by human hands. This rock he takes out of the mountainside, smashes the kingdoms, becomes a mountain, and encompasses the whole earth. This is what's wild to me. Nebuchadnezzar saw Jesus' arrival 600 years before he came. And you know, we just finished celebrating this great reality of Jesus' arrival into our world, and rightly so. We talk about a baby who's been born into the world, but here's the wild thing. 
If, if this is what's happening at the same time that this rock is being cut from the, the mountain and it's destroying this Roman empire, this means this happened when Jesus was born. Not the Revelation 19 Jesus where he's on a white horse and he's got the, the armies of heaven behind him. This is a baby in our eyes, but what God was doing at a cosmic level is he was sending the rock that would destroy the kingdoms of the world, establishing his own. That's so rich, so great. And all the way back then, God gives that to a pagan, tyrannical king. In it, I want you to see a powerful reality at the end of this interpretation. By the way, you must have understood this. Nebuchadnezzar, as he's hearing Daniel not only give the dream, but give the interpretation in real time, he's asking this question. I put before you an impossible task. How on earth could you know That's exactly what I saw in my head. How could you know this? And this king who was ready to just at will execute numerous people in his kingdom, he falls on his face in a position of humility and he says, there is no other God but Daniel's God because he reveals mysteries that no one else could know. Daniel said, even within the part we read, don't credit me with being so sharp. God is the one who's gonna tell you the dream and tell you what it means. Give him all the credit. And my question to you is this. God shows up in this passage in an incredibly powerful, amazing way. And my question to you is, sometimes in our part of evangelicalism, meaning the the like-minded people of Trinity Church, like-hearted people, what we can tend to do is to make our faith so logical, to make it so A plus B equals C, and guess what? In a normative world, A plus B never equals the supernatural. Have we drifted into a place where we just wonder, God, I don't know if you can ever show up in God-sized ways? Daniel and his friends did not believe that. And they entreated God, God, we need you desperately. Our lives are on the line. Please, please show up. I have that in your notes. Daniel didn't go looking for a challenge that day, but he did know where to go when it came to him. Like you and I, we don't need to go looking for challenges in an oppositional culture, but when they come, do you know on whom to rely? Do you know where to go with the need? That's our, our big idea this week. And I wanna say, by the way, in closing, Daniel, as a result of this, Nebuchadnezzar exalts him to the second highest position of leadership in this pagan land of Babylon. Remember, he was an exiled teenager last week. Now he's ruling the kingdom. By the way, sounds a little bit like another young man I remember who also was shipped to another place, exiled there, served in dungeons, but ultimately as the interpretation of a dream was exalted to the place of number two leader in the land called Egypt, a young man named Joseph. God has an interesting way of still influencing a culture that has turned their back on him. How would God want to use you? Our big idea this week, be reliant on God to provide exactly what you need and watch him do what only he can do. I want to close today with one of those prayer exercises we talked about. The band's not going to come back up, but I want you to look again at the prayer that we have recorded in... um, Daniel chapter two. This is that passage when Daniel is just praising God for his amazing power at revealing the dream and the interpretation to him. And what I want you to do, I just want you to pick a line. We're not gonna pray in groups or out loud, but just to yourself, I want you to pick one of those lines from that prayer, and I want that to be a line that prompts you, that prompts you to praise God for what he is doing or what he's done that has demonstrated his power so clearly to you and maybe even to the lives of those that you're doing life with in your world. I'm gonna be quiet and let you focus and then I'll gather us together in a closing prayer before we go.
Father, we all around this auditorium, praises are being lifted to you, prayers of gratitude for the ways that you've worked, the ways that you have shown yourself strong, the ways you have intervened, the ways you've rescued. And we join with Daniel in words of adoration and praise because you are so worthy of them. I think of the line within this prayer that you change times and seasons. And you don't do that asking our permission. You just do. And God, I think about the ways that in my life you have seen fit to change times and seasons to open this door and close another and to direct us toward exactly what your purpose is for us. I thank you that at a very sovereign level, at a very um, mega understanding of everything about our lives, God, you are giving direction and leadership and we can trust your faithfulness and your power. God, our prayers of praise are lifted to you today for being the kind of God we can rely on when our backs are against the wall and we have no idea how things are gonna work out. We are so grateful for your power on display in and through us. We love you and we pray in your great name today, amen. If there is anything that we could be praying for you about today, there'll be some folks up front who would just love to pray with you. They won't counsel you or whatever, just pray. Otherwise, have a great week. We'll see you next weekend.